think, John, with a good crowd like this, the ministers need to go through and collect money now. What do you think? <laughs> we, appre <laughs> we appreciate you being here, and thank you. We hope that you choose to come back and visit with us some more. Let me kind of tell you what we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks that may be of interest to you that you may wish to come back for. Right now, there's a movie out based on what happened to a little boy. He allegedly died, and he says that he actually went to heaven and got to see what was there. It made a book, which sold a whole lot of copies, and now they've made a movie, and the movie's now showing. And I think, I don't know if it's doing well or not well at the box office. I haven't checked. But the people that are going are getting to see what a six-year-old boy thinks heaven looks like. Maybe, just maybe, it would be better if we see what the Bible says that heaven will be like. And so beginning two weeks from today, not, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that, we're going to start a four-part series, Lord willing, about what is heaven like. Now, let me give you a couple of previews. One is, it is not off somewhere in the blue. As a matter of fact, what's going to happen after the resurrection day is that there's going to be a new heaven and new earth. What that means is that we'll actually be living back on this planet and brand new bodies. Now, if you're saying, whoa, wait a minute, what science fiction is this? Then I suggest you come back in a couple of weeks and we'll actually work through the scriptures and through four parts, you know, four Sundays in a row, Lord willing, I will show you what the scripture has to say about that, about the new heaven and the new earth. I think it's a fascinating study. We invite you to come back and be here for that. Now, for today, for today, we're going to talk about something that would typically fit on Easter Sunday, but maybe not the kind of thing you would normally hear. We start our story actually with the people of Israel, that's the Jewish people, living in Egypt. They've been living there for 430 years. They had gone there when Joseph, a Jewish man, had become the second most powerful man in Egypt. He was second only to Pharaoh, the king. Because of his being there and a subsequent famine that came about, he moved all the Israelis, all the Jewish people, down to Egypt. At that point, there were less than 100 of them. Joseph lived to be 110 years old. Because he was in Egypt, they actually embalmed his body so that it could last for a long time after that. After Joseph had died and a couple of pharaohs had passed, there came along a pharaoh that the Bible says knew not Joseph. In other words, he didn't appreciate all the things that Joseph had done. When Joseph had brought the Israeli people, the Jewish people, to Egypt, he had put them in a very wonderful place in Egypt to live where they could grow their crops and their animals and do well. But they kept multiplying. They became bigger and bigger until finally that pharaoh came along who said, there's too many of them. As a matter of fact, there's so many of them. If our enemies were to attack us, these Jewish people might actually side with our enemies and overthrow us. So rather than continuing to let them prosper, we're going to make slaves out of them. And so they did. They enslaved the Jewish people and put them at hard labor doing all kinds of things concerning making bricks and mortar and harvesting the fields and so forth and so on. Then he said, there's still too many of them. And so the way we can stop this is we're going to make sure that all the Jewish boys, when they're born, are going to die, which led to a story of a man by the name of Moses coming along. And so after 430 years, Moses, Moses now is the leader of the people of Israel. And he's come to Pharaoh and he says, basically, let my people go. Pharaoh's thinking, well, this many slaves, by the way, we don't know exactly how many there are now. But it says there's 600,000 men. That doesn't count the women. That doesn't count the children. So probably somewhere between 2 and 3 million Jewish people living in this country. And he's thinking, lose 2 million slaves? Can you imagine what that will do to our economy? Mm, no, no, you can't go. And so the famous story, if you have heard from the Old Testament, the story of the 10 plagues, various plagues that God brought about so that Pharaoh would let the people go. And he would say, okay, no more plagues. You can go. And then he would change his mind until finally the tenth and final plague came along. It would be the death of the firstborn. And so Moses, directed by God, came to Pharaoh, even though the last time he had seen Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, if you come back in here, I'll kill you. He went back to see Pharaoh, and he said, this is what God's going to do. He is going to kill the firstborn. So all the firstborn males, either humans or animals, they're all going to die. And when he does that, then you'll let us go. So he went back to his own people. They had to pass word. Obviously, they didn't have, you know, they couldn't tweet it. They couldn't put it on Facebook. They had to pass it word to word, uh, face to face, mouth to mouth, and say, basically, here's what's going on. God's going to come. He's going to send what actually would be called later the destroying angel. He's going to send the destroying angel. And the destroyer, the destroying angel, is going to kill the firstborn. Now, to keep ourselves from being involved in that, here's what we're going to do. 
at twilight, you're to kill a lamb. Now, he said you can either be a sheep or a goat, but it's going to be a lamb. He is to be a year old. He is to have no blemish. He's to be perfect. In other words, you can't pull a cripple out of the herd. This is going to be something that you would actually sacrifice to give up. And at twilight, you're going to butcher that lamb. Now, you're going to have to eat every bit of it before daylight. So if, if, it's, if you have a small family, then you share with some other family because you don't have any of this left at daylight. And if then, after you do the sharing, you still have any left over, you burn it up. Now, what we're going to do is, before that happens, we have a week. And in this week, we're going to institute a new feast. It was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, I'm, I'm not much of a cook. And I'm certainly not much of a baker. But my understanding is when you put the yeast in, that leavens, it makes the dough rise. It makes bread wonderful. He said, we're not going to have any leaven in the bread for a solid week. So every week, all the bread that you eat will have no leaven. It's going to be basically flat. You do that, and there are going to be a couple of reasons for that. We'll talk about it in a couple of minutes. But you do that for a whole week. And so they had started the, the week of unleavened bread. They could even have yeast in their house. And then he said, okay, this night when you kill the lamb at twilight and then you roast it, you can't boil it, you can't eat it raw, you have to roast it. He gave very specific rules, bitter herbs, those kinds of things. And then you take the blood from that lamb and you take some hyssop, which was kind of a plant, and you brush that in there and then you put some of that blood over the doorpost and on the sides of the doors. And when the destroying angel comes by, he will pass over the houses that have the blood. And so it came to be known as the Passover. Well, if you have heard the Bible story somewhere along the line, you know that that night the destroying angel did come. And in all the Egyptian homes, the firstborn died. The firstborn among their animals died, but none of the Jewish homes that had the blood on the lintels and the doorposts, none of them, the destroying angel passed over them. As a result, they got to leave. So they packed up and they took off. It would be 40 years before they got to the promised land, but that was the way they got out. Now, the Jewish people continued to keep that feast of unleavened bread and the Passover for the rest of their history because it was to remember we were slaves and God delivered us. Now, understand that these, these key ingredients, I mean, there were several ingredients, but the two key ingredients to this was you have the unleavened bread and you have the lamb that you're going to slaughter, a perfect lamb. Now we come to the New Testament. Jesus has been preaching and teaching and making a lot of enemies. He also had a lot of disciples, a lot of people who followed him, but he made a lot of enemies. You must understand that even in our day and time, if you stand up and say what you believe and you say this is the right and this is wrong, there will be people who will become your enemies because they don't see it the same way that you do. And so there are some people that just keep quiet. I won't have any, any enemies because I just keep quiet. Well, they don't have any enemies, but they accomplish very little good either. Jesus had been preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God and all these things that should happen and had made quite a few enemies. And he knew, he knew that they were going to kill him. Now, he even knew that before he got here. What I mean is, is Jesus, that's the human name, the Old Testament version would be Joshua, had existed forever. He was one of what we call the Trinity or the Godhood. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He was the Son. Sometimes we're in the Bible referred to as the Logos. It's the word from which we get logic. He was the logic of God, the reasoning of God. And he had come to earth to be one of us, and so he wanted to experience everything we experience. Therefore, rather than just appearing as an adult or even coming as a teenager, what he chose to do was to actually go into a woman and be born as a baby. And so he had experienced life just as we experience life, experiencing every little part of it. I really wonder what it was like when he went through the terrible twos. But as he goes through that whole process, he's now 30 years old when he starts his ministry. Now at 33, his ministry is about to end, and he knows what's going to happen. He knows that they're going to crucify him. He knows what he's going to go through. And so he is having the Feast of Unleavened Bread with his disciples. The Jewish people have been doing it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. They have this place that Jesus sent them to. They all get there. They're lying around the table. You probably have seen Da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper where he said, everybody get on that side of the table for the picture. That's not the way they did it. They didn't sit in chairs. They had a table that was about oh, 12 to 18 inches high. They would lie on their left sides. And they would prop themselves on their left arms and they would eat with their, eat with their right hand. And they were kind of angled all the way around the table and that's the way they did it. 
So here they were, and they were having their Passover dinner. So we know, we know that they had a lamb, but he's not mentioned in the New Testament. The reason that the lamb is not mentioned in the New Testament is because now we're changing attention from that animal, which was a type of what was to come, to the true lamb that would be sacrificed, which is Jesus the Christ himself. So he is the lamb. So while we know they ate the lamb, it's not mentioned. It's just mentioned that he is there. He is now the lamb that would be sacrificed for everybody. And it mentions the unleavened bread. That becomes an important part of the story. But Jesus introduces a new element to it. Now, we know that all through the time that they had probably been drinking wine with this, but this now is mentioned that they're about to have wine. And so before, before they ever take the bread, he holds up a cup of wine. He says, I want you to all drink this because I'm not going to drink it again until I drink it with you in the kingdom. And then in a couple of minutes after that, he's going to talk about the unleavened bread and what it's going to symbolize. And then he's going to talk about, again, the wine and what it symbolizes. And then we get the idea of what Easter is all about. You see, sometimes you, well, we even sang it a little while ago. We sang an old, old song called There's Power in the Blood. I've been hearing that all of my life, and I've been around close to 200 years now. And I've been singing that song a long, long time. Sometimes people look at that and go, what does that mean? And you'll often hear people who are Christians say something like, he shed his blood for us, we're saved by his blood. But they really don't understand what that means. So let me see if I can explain it very quickly. Jesus, Jesus was going to the cross. He was going to be crucified because that was the way that the Romans were killing people at the time. It could be that they would hang people, but they're not doing that right now. It could be they could just take people and stone them to death, but that was a Jewish way of doing it, and the Romans weren't doing that. Their preferred method of execution at this point was crucifixion. You have seen a crucifix where they take the wood and they, they put a cross beam on it. They'll put a little step kind of at the bottom of the thing, and then they put a person on there. The more common way to crucify people was not done with nails. The most common way to crucify them was to tie ropes around their arms and ropes around their feet. That was actually the worst way. The nails, as bad as they are, was the more humane way to crucify somebody. Because when they did it with the ropes, there was no bleeding. And sometimes it would last for days before they died, and it was an extremely excruciating and painful way to go. The reason they're going to use nails on this day when they're going to crucify Jesus is because of the fact that they need him to die pretty quickly. So they're not just going to use nails, they're going to use more, but part of the reason for using the nails is to expedite the death. So here he is the night before, and he's at this Passover dinner with his disciples, and his heart is heavy because he knows what he's about to face. And he looks at his disciples and says, one of you is going to betray me. So they start mumbling among themselves, whispering back and forth. Is it I? Is it, could it be me? Who's he talking about? Now we get an idea who is where, because it says that the apostle John leaned his head over on Jesus' chest. So if Jesus is lying here, that means that John was just to his right. By the way, when, when the Lord of the manor, when the master would put somebody right there on his right, that was the chosen one. John, John was the chosen one. And so he was here just on Jesus' right. We also now can understand where Peter is because Peter's going to lean over and whisper to John. So just to the right of John is Peter. And so Peter, Peter leans over, leans over to John and says, ask him who it is. Peter was always impetuous. He didn't pay much attention to the rules of society or even being polite. And so John then did something extremely touching. It says he leaned his head on Jesus' chest. Now, if they'd been in chairs, that would have been a very awkward movement. But since he's lying right here, it just means that he laid his head back. So that his head, the top of his head touched the chest of Jesus, their eyes an inch or so apart. A very, very intimate move. I guess probably most American men would not do that because we're not trained to be intimate with other men. But in that culture, it made sense. And so here he was. But rather than doing what Peter said, ask him who it is, because he loved Jesus so much, he just simply said, me? Is it I? And Jesus, to reassure him, said, no, it's the one I'm about to point out. And he pointed out Judas. And then he said to Judas, if you're going to do it, go do it now. So Judas got up and left. 
Jesus took the apostles with him, the rest of them, up to a place where he normally would go so Judas would know how to find him. He took the, the three that were the closest to him, James and Peter and John, he, took them, he takes them up there and, and he goes off to pray. If you heard the story, you might remember that in his prayer, he was begging, Father, if there's any other way, please take this cup from me. Now, I've heard people make big deals out of what was going to happen to Jesus next when it comes to the physicality of it, where that he was scourged, and scourging was a terrible thing. It's when they would tie a man down and they would beat him and beat him and beat him. I'm not going to go into all the detail because the kids are still here. Plus, you probably don't want to hear how bad that really was, but it was a pretty nasty thing. Some men would die just in that beating, that scourging, that flogging. Then they took him, and they took him out and crucified him, and they drove the nails. Again, they needed to because it's Friday morning. The Jewish Sabbath is going to begin at 6 p.m., and they understood that the Jews would rise up and protest if they had men hanging on those crosses when the Sabbath started, so they needed to be dead by 6 p.m., and they are ridiculing Jesus. Again, I've heard the stories about how tough it must have been for the nails to go into his hands and how rough it would have been on that blood he'd torn back to have the splinters of the cross. And I'm not, I'm not in any way trying to say that those things weren't painful. But they are not the key to the story. As a matter of fact, there'd be many disciples of Jesus who, because of following him, would be crucified. And many of them would go to their crucifixions singing praising God for the opportunity. Now, I just don't think that they were braver than he. So what was it that he was so afraid of? So in the garden the night before, he's praying diligently, oh, Father, if there's any other way, please take this cup from me. In other words, if you can think of anything else, Father, don't make me do this, please. So was he dreading a scourging? Was he dreading nails? Was he dreading splinters? Based on what he was facing, those things would fall into pale comparison. According to the scriptures, what would happen is this, that when Jesus, when Jesus was on the cross, Paul would explain this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that when Jesus was on the cross, God made him sin for us. So what does that mean? Well, now we begin to understand what it means when it talks about the blood of Jesus. You see, Jesus had no sin. He was the only man who had ever lived a perfect life. Now, babies, if a baby were to die, a baby's perfect, but we're talking about somebody who's actually gotten old enough to understand what he or she is doing, and, and nobody but him had ever lived that perfectly. And so here he is, having lived that perfect life. He is God. God is holy. It is God's most outstanding characteristic. Sometimes if you were to ask people, give me a descriptive of God, you'll hear words like, he's powerful. Absolutely. He, God is love. Yes, he is. There are passages that actually say that God is love. But the thing about God mentioned more than any other is that God is holy. You say, what does that mean? It means without sin. God is sinless. He is holy. He has no sin. So Jesus, who has never, ever sinned, as God is now hanging on a cross, but in a human form, so they can do this to him because if he were in God form, they couldn't. But in human form, he's hanging there. And when the Bible says that he was made sin for us, that means that every sin from the beginning of time until the end of time, that every sin that would ever be forgiven was put on him at that cross. So on the cross, Jesus became a thief. On the cross, Jesus became a liar. On the cross, he became an adulterer, a child abuser, a murderer. Anything and everything that he would ever forgive, he became on that cross. Now, when that happened, something transpired that we really cannot comprehend. I mean, even if we read it and intellectually understand it, we really can't comprehend it. Because when that happened, when all that sin was placed on him, something happened for the only time in history. Again, that I don't know how to explain, but, but the Father and the Holy Spirit, who are both, of course, sinless, just as the Son, the Logos, Jesus, was sinless, the Father backs away. 
And now he who is part of the Godhood, he who is part of the Godhead, the Trinity, whatever word you want to use, he is now suffering an unimaginable pain because he is now totally separated from his father, which is what happens with sin. And in that agony, and by the way, to demonstrate it, the whole world turned dark. Why would it turn dark? Because God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So the whole world turns dark. Nature, nature is now abrogated. And as he's there in that pain, I don't know that splinters would make much difference. You say, why? Because you see, if, if you begin to understand the biblical concept of hell, you understand that hell is being totally out of the presence of God. It's where God is not. So in that sense, in that sense, while he's hanging on the cross, he is in hell. He is away from the Father. And the pain of that is something that you and I can't even begin to imagine. We can't even begin to think about how much did that hurt God, the Son, to be away from God, the Father. And in that agony, he dies. But he dies two deaths. The first death, he died to the Father. In the sense that death means separation. That's what the word death means, a separation. And so he was separated from the Father, so he dies spiritually. Again, I don't know how to comprehend that. He dies spiritually. And that lasts until he dies physically, where the human body would finally succumb to all that was going on and he would be dead. And in anticipation of that pain and that agony, the night before he was begging the father please please don't make me do that and as we mentioned many times before dr luke gives us an extra detail luke's a physician in the gospel of luke he says he sweated as it were blood meaning meaning that he was so terrified that the capillaries in his forehead had burst a man that terrified is almost always perspiring, and so the perspiration and the blood would mix, and it looks just like they're sweating blood. It is a clear sign that he was absolutely terrified of what was about to happen. So there he was in my place. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. I have sinned. I have not been perfect. I, I could look back and say I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, except most of the things I did wrong I did on purpose. Anybody else like that? It wasn't a mistake. It was something I actually did on purpose. I knew better and I did it anyway. And here all that stuff is and I need to be forgiven. And so on the cross, he has it. You say, well, what's blood got to do with it? Blood is the symbol of what's going on there. The Bible is full of symbols. And this blood is symbolic. And the Old Testament is said this way. The, the life is in the blood. That's why in the Old Testament, they were not allowed to ever eat blood. They wouldn't have any blood pudding or blood sausage or the kind of things that people around the world eat because blood was considered to be the life. Life is in the blood. Therefore, life, blood is holy. And it was always considered to be holy in everything that happened. So when we say he shed his blood for us, it's a euphemistic way. It's a symbolic way of saying that he took my sin and was separated from the Father. He was separated from the Father. He was, in essence, in hell. And that's what we mean when we say he shed his blood for us. The blood is just symbolic of everything else that he did. And so as he hung there, as he hung there in that tremendous pain, when it got near the time for the end, is when he screamed. The Hebrew writer says he did. He screamed it. He screamed a language that most everybody there did not know how to understand. He screamed, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And the reason he was screaming was because it hurt so bad. It's interpreted for us. He was screaming, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He actually knew the answer to that. It was not a question he asked because he didn't know. It was indescribable pain, screaming is what it was. Where have you gone? Why are you not here? Why did you make me do this? All of those things in capital in that one phrase as he screams to the Father in amazing pain, which is what he did so that whatever I have done can be completely 
and absolutely forgiven, not, not because God just says, yeah, we'll forget about that. God never says, we'll forget about that. God says, I will, I'll let him pay for it. And so when I profess my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when I yield my life to him, when I become an arbitrary or a Christian, then, then all of the stuff I've done is actually put on him back there. You say, but, but I'm doing that now and he died then. We understand God to be timeless. That there's nothing about time that, that limits God in any shape, fashion, or form. And so all of my sin is placed on him there. And then I can sing, I'm washed in the blood. Which means my sin has been taken off of me and put on him there. So let's read those passages, gentlemen. First, First Corinthians chapter 10. The Apostle Paul is now explaining about what we call the Lord's Supper. It's our version of the Passover feast. And he says, it's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ. And it's not the bread that we break, a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of one loaf. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So in chapter 11, Apostle Paul comes back to the same visit, the thing we call the Lord's Supper, our version of the Passover. And he says, for I receive from the Lord, in other words, Jesus himself taught me this. Jesus came and taught Paul after he had died and been resurrected. Paul didn't know Jesus when he was still in the flesh. But the Lord himself had taught. He said, for the Lord, for I received this from the Lord, what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. Understand the symbolism? The Bible's full of symbols. This is my body, which is for you. Do this, meaning eat this, in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. That would be the wine. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep, by the way, is a euphemism for dead. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. I'll stop right there. Now, what did you just say? We, in our church, we take communion every Sunday. Some churches take it sporadically. The Lord himself took it that night with his disciples on a Thursday night. It was because he was going to be crucified the next morning. And he said this, this bread, which has been a symbol all along, is now going to change its symbolism and become something even more important than it symbolized before. And the fruit of the vine, the wine, that he now introduces is going to symbolize my now, when he says there that if you're going to take it, don't do it in an unworthy fashion. But he went ahead to explain what that means. He says, don't do it without realizing what the symbols are. That's what he explains there. So it should never be something you do just because it's a ritual. It, it should never be something you do just because we do it every Sunday. It should never be something you do because you're just hungry. It's okay to be hungry, but you don't do this just because you are hungry. As a matter of fact, some of the people in that church, he said, you guys sometimes actually get drunk doing this. Can you see how you've missed everything? So what do you do? You show the Lord's death to the world, but you show it to yourself. And so what we have done, we don't have one cup that could be passed among 11 people 
we have modernized it. We don't use wine anymore, although we could. But because of the fact that it's much more acceptable in our culture, we use grape juice. But think about it. Think about what that color represents. That color represents symbolically blood. But now you understand that it's not just blood. That blood itself is the symbol. It's symbolizing to us what Jesus did on the cross for us. He took my sin so I can be clean. So now I live a clean life. You mean you've reached perfection? No, but I have been forgiven of everything. Everything. And when I stumble, I continue to be forgiven of everything. Not because God says just ignore it. God never ignores it. But because God says the debt is paid. And so when I drink that, it should never be, okay, let's get it done. When I drink that, it should always be, oh, God. I'm bad. I'm weak. I'm sinful. I'm certainly impure. But because of that not that juice, but what that juice symbolizes. Because of that, I am completely forgiven. I am completely clean. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to ask the guys to pass around the fruit of the vine. If you are a believer, please take it with us. If, on the other hand, you say, I I really have nothing to do with Jesus, would you be willing to let us, in a one-on-one session or maybe your family and a couple of us, whatever's comfortable, teach you about Jesus, show you these passages, let you go through them for yourselves, think on them, contemplate, work them out so that it makes sense to you, so they're not just doing something because we said it, but because you understand it, that this really is from God. So if you're not a believer, we'd love for you to take communion with us, but after you become a believer. Now, nobody's going to police you. Nobody's going to come around and look you in the eye and say, are you a believer before you take this? That's not what's going on here at all. But if you have a relationship with God, maybe, just maybe, before you drink it, you should thank him personally for what he did. And if you feel you've not been living like you should, ask him again, Lord, cleanse me. And I'm going to hold the symbol in my hand. I'm going to put it in my body. It symbolizes what you did for me on the cross. And amen, we'll pass that in just one moment. May I pray? Father, thank you. Bless this cup. Father, thank you for what Jesus did for us. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name.
on that day of the crucifixion, it had gotten late. It was about three o'clock and the Sabbath was going to start at six and these men had to be buried before the Sabbath. So the Roman soldiers who were doing the crucifixion did what they had to do. They came along to break the legs of the people who were being crucified, which would lead to asphyxiation. You see, they had that little wooden ledge they could push up on and get a breath. But with the legs broken, they would sag down and sag on themselves and literally die because they couldn't breathe. So to hasten the death, they came and they broke the legs of each of the two men on either side of Jesus. They came to break his legs, but realized that he was already dead. But just to make sure, they thrust a spear into his side, and now came blood and water, indicating that his heart had failed. He was dead. Joseph of Arimathea took the body, put him in his own tomb. And if that story had ended there, we would say, well, it was a good idea. But he was just another radical religious, religious man who came along and started a cult and eventually died. But the story did not in there on the third day he resurrected came back to life in full vitality that by the way is what sets Christianity apart from every other world religion not only did our founder our leader die uh, but our founder our leader came back to life the empty tomb the resurrection which proves that he indeed is the son of God with power and then in that new body, which was glorious, which was an amazing body, he still ate, he but also could walk through walls. He could even change his appearance so that, that those who knew him best couldn't recognize him until he decided that they could. It was just an amazing body that he had. And you say, wow, then that's, that's a wonderful body. It really is. And according to 1 John 3, 2, come resurrection, we got a body like that. I'm actually looking forward to that. I'm hoping that it also doesn't gain weight. So I can just eat whatever I want to eat. But he had another body. Because that new body would ascend back into the heavens. And so he said that my people, the ones who follow me, are also my body. Like that 1 Corinthians 10 verse back up there again, gentlemen. 1 Corinthians 10. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? But catch this. And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Why is it unleavened? Well, for two reasons. One is because it was the bread of the Passover, and, and the Lord wanted them ready to leave at any second's notice. Therefore, you don't wait for the bread to rise. There is no yeast. No yeast. You just eat it without the yeast because then you can go when you need to go. But there's a second reason. Throughout the Bible, and again, the Bible's a book full of symbolisms. Throughout the Bible, yeast, leaven, is a symbol of evil. So that Jesus would want to teach his, his disciples, beware of the leaven, the yeast, of the Pharisees. They thought he was talking about real yeast. He explained, no, no, it's a symbol. It's a symbol. It means evil. And so the bread that we take today, like the Passover bread, is unleavened. It has no yeast in it. Part of that's because they were able to flee, but more importantly, because of the symbolism of it. It is pure. But when we take the bread, we, we take the, the fruit of the vine, we take the wine, because of our individual relationship with the Lord through what Jesus has done for us. It's about me, about I'm forgiven, the fact that God loves me, I love God, and we have come in contact with each other. So the fruit of the vine, the wine, is about me. The bread, the bread is about us. It's a participation in the body of Christ. You might be thinking, well, is that such a big deal? Try to be on your own in anything in life. I don't care what it is that you do. I think every one of us would discover in life that it's just tough not to have somebody there. There are times when you need somebody to hold your hand. There are times. There are times when you need somebody to put their arms around you and give you a big hug. There are times when you just need somebody to sit in that next chair and not say a word. There are times when you also need that person to come in and tell you, I understand that things look bad, but I am here. I am with you. You will never be abandoned. We get that from family, hopefully, our family of origin, the families we developed since then, hopefully, unfortunately, some don't. But we also get that in the family of God, the body of Christ. 
You say, then, then since the bread is pure, the body of Christ is pure, where we're supposed to be. The only problem is it's full of people. And because it's full of people, there are always going to be people who are imperfect in it. But we seek for the perfect and pure body. So in just a moment, we're going to take the bread, unleavened bread. I ask that when you take it, you do not eat it. Just take it and hold it, if you will. Gentlemen, please pass that. And when you get it, just hold it, if you will, for a moment. Thank you, Lord, for your body, the one that you lived in when you hung on that cross and gave your life for us. Thank you, Lord, for your body, the one that you resurrected with, which is so marvelous and gives us an anticipation of things to come for us. Thank you, Lord, for your body, which is us, those who follow you. Thank you for the symbolism of this unleavened bread that shows what we strive to send this perfection together in you and thank you for the blood because that covers us when we're not perfect lord thank you shall we take this together <laughs> 